Hello everybody and welcome to another entry in my mini-series, A Life in Cars, where I talk to passionate petrol heads about their motoring memories and the moments that have defined them. I want to say a huge thank you to all of you that have been tuning into this series. The feedback has been absolutely amazing. Myself and my contributors are really, really happy with it. For those who have been following the series thus far, today's video I hope will be an absolute treat, and one with a slightly different perspective than that you'll have seen already. Our star in question is a man called Michael. I first met Michael way back in 2016 at a local car event where he was selling copies of his first book called Let Them Stare. In this he recalls an era from the 1960s to the 1980s where he owned a series of cars that today we would call unobtainium. Things like the GT40, the Lamborghini Miura, the Di Tommaso Pantera, all cars that came through his hands thanks to the fact that he was a petrol head and at the time circumstances allowed it. Today, if you were to try and rebuild the collection Michael has had through his lifetime, it would cost you tens of millions of pounds. But one of the reasons I love this book so much is that when he had them, that wasn't how they were viewed. They were simply old cars that not a lot of people were that interested in. And so he drove them accordingly. He simply loved cars and just got his hands on the best ones that he could. The book is full of quite entertaining, sometimes risque stories, and I think anybody with petrol in their veins would certainly enjoy it. In today's video, we're going to be talking you through a few of the cars detailed in this book and its sequel, Let Them Stare Again, as well as talking to Michael about a few of the things in his life that have shaped the way he views the world. And if you've enjoyed today's video, don't forget, hit the like button, comment down below, share it with all of your friends, subscribe if you haven't already, and if you want a little bit more from him on the cars that he has owned, the book is still available to purchase. I'll leave a link in the description down below. So without any further ado, over to Michael. I was born on March 23rd, 1947, at our Essex farmhouse um, on the edge of Sybil Headingham. And I actually lived there with the family and my brother for 25 years. Uh, my brother was born three years after me, and we then had what can be considered as an idyllic childhood. We weren't into cars. Um, our first interest was aeroplanes because the farm bordered RAF Wethersfield, where in the early 50s there were 7,000 American personnel and we used to go up with a picnic and a dog, climb over the perimeter fence, sit down and we watched these planes coming back from Korea where the Americans were having a bit of a scrap. So we, we, we loved the Sabres, the Super Sabres, the F-104 Starfighters, the F-105 Thunder Chiefs, and they were coming back in a terrible state. I mean, they were, you could see they'd been hit, they were all smoking, so how they got back from Korea, I would never ever know. So that was my first interest with my brother. A bit of a light bulb moment in 1960. The government decreed that all cars over 10 years old should have a Ministry of Transport test, what we call the MOT. My dad said he was quite keen that we drove around because we'd been driving tractors since we were eight. And in those days, tractors had two seats and the, the David Brown tractor, I sat in the passenger seat with one of the, with the chaps that was working on the farm and we just loved it. Dad went to the local garage, 1960, Gibson's garage in Swan Street, Sybil Headingham, and said to the, the, the owner, what's happening to all these cars that are failing the MOT? The chap said, well, we've been told to scrap them. So Dad said to him, if you get a car that's failed an MOT but is working and it's failed just because of rust, let me know. We might be keen on having a few of them. So they agreed a price of, what is the 30 bob, which is today £1.50, for this, these wrecks of cars. And the first car we ever got um, I thought was an Austin 7. I was 13, brother was 10. So we were roaring around in this thing until it virtually fell to bits. When I printed my first book, a chap contacted me from Australia and he said, oh, by the way, that isn't an Austin 7. He said, that is a one of three very early Jensen's. And I thought, my goodness, we'd had a Jensen, thrashed it to bits. Of course, we didn't know it at the time. The next car we had was a Riley Monaco which again has become quite valuable. And our best and fastest was something called a Vauxhall 6, which was really quick, six cylinder. And we would just roar around the fields because we had a, a herd of 80 cows. So we had plenty of pasture, 
when the cows weren't in there, we were in with the car. And we started then to change our views from aeroplanes to cars. And we got Dad interested as well. So it was a, it was a good start, and I suppose up to, the, up to the age of 10 years old, we, um, we were a happy family. Uh, we had a nanny, Mildred, who looked after us. And as a matter of fact, she looked after my dad when he was born as well. So she taught us a few things about life. And I think that upbringing made us very, my brother and I, quite confident. And we got the feeling that adversity that was obviously going to come sooner or later in life, we could deal with. And I think um, through life, we've often thought back, you know, we were so lucky. But it wasn't a hugs and kisses family. You know, it was quite formal, a little bit of deference. Um, I, when I went to boarding school, and my brother and I went to boarding school when we were nine, we'd come back, see Dad, he'd shake our hand and said, hello, son. And I don't ever remember him calling me Michael, actually, in all the years he was alive. So we were happy, but we were happy at a distance. He liked Fords. We had a Ford console. Uh, we then had a Ford 105E Anglia. And then we started to get more interested in cars, so we went for a Sunbeam Rapier second-hand one. It didn't turn out to be a good car, but we liked the rapier. So Dad part exchanged that car for a Series 4 rapier in gold, which was a lovely looking thing. And we then thought, oh, can we make it faster? So Dad was becoming a bit of a petrol head. So we took the car down to Jack Brabham's um, garage in Chessington in Surrey for a conversion. Cylinder head done, had a special exhaust, and I, I don't know whether the camshaft was changed. It came back quicker and it came back noisier, so we were quite happy. But it was quite expensive. So one of the first journeys out after the conversion was to see a film in Braintree at the Embassy Cinema, and it was called How the West Was Won. And it was a film, that, the first film where sound surround, massive screen, loved it. So me, Dad and my brother. On the way home, we're going out of Braintree on Broad Road and we get lights hard behind us. So brother looked round, he said, Dad, that's a Lotus Cortina. Dad hadn't heard of a Lotus Cortina. This was 1963, it had just been announced. Dad said, well, we'll show him. So we went out towards Gosfield. Dad put his foot down and this Lotus Cortina came by us as though we were standing still. Dad didn't speak, none of us could talk. Got home, wasn't mentioned again. Next morning, Dad was on the phone to our local Ford dealer in Haverhill called Cleels Limited. And he knew the manager there quite well. And it's just so happened that the manager had a Lotus Cortina as his company car. We dealt with Cleels from the farm because you know we had 500 acres, 80 cows, and we did need an agricultural a merchant to buy stuff from and we use Cleels. And anyway, we borrowed this car for three days. We were blown away, 105 brake horsepower, five and a half inch wide wheels and a good looking machine. So we decided, we decided to order a car. So the Mark I Lotus Cortina had um, aluminium doors, boot and bonnet and a, and a what they call an A-bracket rear axle. But we ordered, because it was the new version, the Mark II version, Mark, it was the Mark II of the first series. And that had uh, no aluminium boot and doors, and, but it had got this A-bracket suspension. And that cost £995, brand new. So we used that for a while, uh, but there was problems with these rear axles. The rear axle went back and it was changed. But what my brother and I did, which was quite naughty at the time, uh, Mum and Dad used to go to Ibiza every year before it became trendy. And um, we were looked after by Nanny. She went to bed early. So my brother and I, at night, used to take the car out. I was, um, so this was 1966, so I was, what, 18 or 19, brother a bit less. And we were lucky because the farm was surrounded by a three miles of road with no houses. We'd go out, roll around, and we came back one day and parked it up in the garage, but it, there was a thud. Something had broken, so we left it there, shaking like a leaf, went back to bed, because this was one o'clock in the morning, and um, 
Dad came back from holiday, got in the car, ooh, wouldn't move. And what had happened was that this rear axle, this A-bracket suspension rear axle, had broken. So he rings up the dealer. The dealer says to him, oh, we've had a lot of trouble with these. We'll come and change, take the car back under warranty and change the rear axle to the new type. So he never actually knew that we'd been out and breaking it. The first legitimate car that we, I drove was a Morris 1000 pickup because I passed my test a couple of months after the um, 17th birthday. So say May 60, whatever it was, 64. I'd had uh, driving lessons in a Mini, I think which were about 15 shillings an hour, at 75p. And strangely, on the test day, we were going down the high street and I saw ahead a woman with a pushing a, wheel, a wheelchair with a baby in it. And she came out between some cars. I'd slammed on the brakes quicker than the instructor because it was dual control. And we'd been out only on the road about five minutes and he says, you've passed. And we went back. So that was my test. A bit of a fluke, but it worked well. So I, Dad said, well, what we'll do is we'll buy a farm vehicle so you can start to learn to drive. So it was a Morris 1000 pickup. And um, I used that for six or seven months, really just to get the hang of the road. I left school when I was 16. I wasn't bright enough to do A-levels. I came back and I worked on the farm for a couple of years, but it wasn't really my scene. You know, I was getting on a tractor in the morning, ploughing 30 acres with a with two furrow plough, which takes a long while. And I said to Dad, um, I'm quite keen to get into the garage business. So he said, well, we'll have a look round. He was very keen that I didn't borrow money from anybody except the family. His mantra was, banks are fine weather friends. And he mentioned this quite a lot. So initially, when um, I wanted something better than the Morris 1000 pickup, I borrowed some money and then I bought a, it was a Triumph Herald 1200 Coupe, went down to, to look at it in Surrey, place called Thornton Heath, bought it, drove it back. So I kept that for probably a year, but by that time I put a wooden steering wheel on it because everybody bought accessories from Les Leston. Wooden steering wheel, stripes up the bonnet, um, just to sort of smarten it up a bit. And then from there, um, we went to, I went to a Triumph Spitfire, which was a 1964 Spitfire that I bought in 1966. So I was getting into cars, and so I said, you know, I'm really keen to get into the garage business. And we had a local village to us called Blackmore End, and there was a garage that came up for sale. A normal garage pumps the lot, so that was 1971, and it was £8,000. So I borrowed the money from Dad, and I bought the garage, which I had for 11 years, and that was really the beginning of the real petrol head stuff. So 1971, we buy the garage, which was a, a terrible wreck of a place. It was called Old School Garage, Blackmore in Braintree. And we spent quite a lot of time and money getting it together, um, refurbishing it. I then uh, looked round to employ mechanics. So I employed two mechanics to start. We didn't have an MOT station, we had to do that locally. We didn't have what I would call any serious problems in all the 10 years, but it was a slog. And I think we only had really, I would say three out of the 10 years where we were considered to be profitable because we sold second-hand cars as well. And, um, but it was an eye-opener because this is such a huge learning curve it was just useful also because I was starting to get interested in really nice cars and to have a garage would, would, it was, saved us so much money because you could do all the work yourself. So that was 71 um, and then we sold the farm. My brother and I had a word with dad and just said, let's face it, he was the best dad in the world. And we said, look, there's a bit of money about now from the farm. We think we ought to buy a few proper cars and try and you know, make some money. So he, was, he wasn't anti it at all. So he retired to a uh, house in Brettenham in Suffolk. Retirement didn't suit him. He'd been working flat out all his life. He retired um, in his late 50s. And he's, sadly, his health went downhill. And uh, he died in 2007. 
1997. We said to him, um, there was a very nice Ferrari GTO for sale in Cheshire, and it was £6,250. And he said, well, we'll go and look at it. At that time, Mum was moaning that she got a Mini, and she could see it cars on the horizon. So Dad and I went to London one day, and we bought her a Sunbeam Tiger, the 4.2 litre Series 1 Sunbeam Tiger, uh, for £715. Bought it back, she loved it. So we then felt we were in a better position to buy some decent stuff ourselves. So Dad and I went to um, Cheshire, uh, a chap called Brian Classic had it for sale, and it was a long trip, like three and a half hours. Beautiful car, I didn't drive it. And Dad said, I don't like this bloke's accent. I said, I said Dad, he's from the north. He said, yes, not only that, he said, but the car's Italian, he said, and Dad fought in the war in Burma and he was a bit anti-Italian. So I said, well, why didn't you say this before we went all the way up? He said, oh, it's a nice trip out. So we came back and years and years later, I found out that the car actually belonged to Colin Crabb and he had part exchanged it. So it was a famous car and today we know it'd be worth between 40 and 50 million. So that was a bit of an error. So. Then we said, well, can we buy a Ford? Oh, I love Fords. So my brother was working at Hexagon of Highgate, exotic car dealers. And it, this was the early 70s where we were having a petrol crisis, electrical pr crisis. At the garage, I had to shut the pumps off at three o'clock. And if people wanted petrol, we had to wind the, wind the pumps up. And that went on for quite a long while. It was, it was a very dark period, to put it another way. So he rang, David rang one day, he said, oh, we've got a car coming in that we don't want. Do you think it's a good idea if we buy it? And it was a Ford GT40. So I said, well, I think we should certainly look at that car. He said, well, we're not going to take it in because that stuff is not selling at the moment, eight or nine miles to the gallon. You know, it stinks of petrol. Let's face it, it, it ran at Le Mans in 65 and it hadn't been changed. So I went up to look at the car in London belonged to a chap called Julian Seddon, who was a society photographer. And it, it was his second GT40. And um, we went into this uh, lock-up garage, opened the door, and this amazing-looking GT40 was there. It was brown with gold stripes. So he said, well, well, let's go out. So we went out on a road above London called the West Way, backwards and forwards, and it was so quick. So we came back, and he wanted £5,000. And I said, well, you know, we can only go to four and four five. We agreed at 4,600. So the next day in the morning I went to the bank because everything then was paid for with the banker's draft which was safe money. Went to the bank, uh, got a cheque for 4,600 and went up to London and I'd never driven a GT40 before. We're in the middle of London and it was a hot day. So we get in the car, say goodbye to him, blah blah blah. And I then set off down the embankment. There was traffic. I was just looking at all the dials, but it never got hot. And the reason why was it was running on Webers, which are a much better system on a GT40 than a Holly, Holly carburetor. So it never got hot. But you couldn't open the doors. You had a very small window that you could open on the side. So it was absolutely boiling. And of course, it's sort of the doors lift up. And I was every time we stopped in traffic, it was up. But we got home, or I got home, and up the drive. And Dad said, I thought you were buying a Ford. I said, well, it is a Ford, Dad. It's a Ford GT40. Oh, then that was the end of it. Took him around the roads. And he basically said, that it's so uncomfortable. It's hot. But if you think it'll you know, do well in the years to come, you know, no problem. So that was, that was 71, and um, so that was the GT40. We kept that for five years. Um, it wasn't a real problem. It wasn't satisfactory on the road. It wasn't a proper road car. It still had racing tyres on. It turned out to be an iconic vehicle that people now would pay five, six million pounds for. But, so that was really the first entry into exotic cars. I had a, a girlfriend that I go and visit in Sudbury, and I go through Castle Henningham, and pa apparently the, all the tellies were going like this because it hadn't got 
whatever you're meant to have on a car to stop the electrical things it hadn't got. And so I was stopped one day, one morning actually, and the chap came out, very nice man, and he said, um, every time you go through the town, we know it's you because we lose, it goes, the tellies go bzzz, like this. So I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take it down to the electrical chap and get whatever he's doing. So he put whatever equipment, electrical equipment it was, and it stopped. Apart from that, um, we never had any ag from the police or anybody. And we used to go quite quick in it. But um, it was just a piece of life that probably I didn't appreciate at the time. But I now realise how lucky I was. Spring of 72, I was working for a six months at Weathersfield Air Base in their stores. And at the time, I had an Elan Sprint drophead that we'd built. I was waiting to turn into Weathersfield, one, and I could hear this noise in the distance. This is early morning, about half past seven. And I could see this car coming towards us at a huge speed, silver. And I knew it was a Ferrari. Got close, I knew it was a Ferrari 275 GTB. And I thought, oh, what a car. So I spent the day thinking about it. Six months went by, still in the Elan. I'd finished working at Weathersfield, and I was getting petrol at a garage in Finchingfield, a Jesmond garage, and I noticed that that Ferrari was in there having a new bumper put on the front where a tractor had reversed into it. So I said to Cyril, who owned the garage, if that car ever comes up for sale, I'd be very keen on making an offer for it. Gave him my number, thought nothing of it. A few months later, Zero rings from the garage. Oh, he said, the local farmer who owns that car, his name is Ian Yates, wants to sell it. And I said, how much does he want for it? He said, well, I'm afraid he wants 2,800 pounds. So I went back home, um, spoke to dad. I said, there's a chance we could get our first Ferrari. Ford's GT40s had started to creep up a bit, even in a few months. So we felt we had an argument to buy our first Ferrari and um, looked at the car, didn't drive it, gorgeous looking thing. Been parked in a garage for a while, so it was a bit messy. So we did a deal, um, 2,600 pounds. And I had that car for two years. But in the interim, I had my first spat with my dad. We went for lunch at the Swan at Lavenham, and I said to him, I'm bringing my new car. And the reason why he wasn't involved was I didn't need to borrow the money from him because my granddad had died in 1962 and eventually we had a bit of money filtering through which allowed me to buy the Alans. So we got, I had this money and I bought the car and then I went to Swan at Lavin to show it to Dad. Mum was there and he was very, very cross. So he said, why have you got a Ferrari before I've had one? So that was his beef. And it was probably five or six years before he bought a, a Ferrari 308 GT4. Anyway, when I bought the Ferrari, I bought it home. Um, my wife was very unhappy that I'd spent 2,600 because our first house only cost 3,400. So she said, why have we got this, this, that and the other? So when I, I went to have it painted, it was silver. And I had this f thing about all Ferraris should be red. So the chap who I rented a spray shop to at the garage, I said, can you paint this red? He said, do you know how much the paint costs? I said, no. He said, well, it's really expensive from Ferrari. I said, I think it was called Rosso. I said, well, get the equivalent Ford color. So he found Ford Monaco red for about a tenth of the price. We painted Monaco red. But in the interim, while he was sanding it down, he rang me. It was a Saturday morning, I was at home. He rang and said, Governor, he said, this car is aluminium. I said, no, he said, it can't be aluminium. He said, it's aluminium. So I, w I rushed up and saw that it was aluminium. It was right-hand drive, aluminium. So I rushed back home, I got my Ferrari books out, and there was only six in the world, right-hand drive, and this was one of them. So I thought, my goodness. Rushed up, told my wife, I said, look, we bought this car, 2,600, and it's worth a lot more. It's aluminium. Meant nothing. 
So um, that was really fortuitous because I had no idea. It had, had a, uh, it had been owned originally by Pad, uh, Paddy McNally who started the F1 Paddock Club and had a bit of a, an affair with uh, Sarah Ferguson. So he's a quite a well-known chap and I think he's worth half a billion pounds now. But so I rang him, I said, have you got a picture of it? Well, it was silver and he hadn't because by this it was red. I hadn't got any pictures of silver. So when I saw it at Tallacrest, it had gone back to the original silver. So um, that was um, quite a good story. It never, it broke down on me twice. I had a rear suspension brake coming back from work, which was relatively simple to do at the garage. And then I had a bit of a nightmare going to Brands. Um, there was a GT40 day at Brands. So the GT40 went down on a trailer and I followed in the GTB. And coming back, the clutch went to the floor. The um, slave cylinder had broken or something. It was pouring juice out. So th that was really the only time that it caused a problem. But, you know, in, in its day, it was a good-looking car. So I kept that car for two years, and I sold it for 4200 So it was a good profit. Just a couple of, what, six or seven years ago, I saw the car for sale. And I rang him and I said, oh, I used to own that car. Um, can we, can I come and look at it? And he said, well, you can buy it if you like. I said, well, I sold it for, you know, 4,200. Oh, he said, we want 2.2 million now. My brother um, was studying at the Chelsea College of Automobile Engineering. And he used to come down at weekends with friends. He was, what, 18. And one day, um, his friend came down in a Cooper S. And... I didn't really know much about them. This was probably 1968. The chap said, well, do you want to have a drive? So we went round our three-mile strip, and it was so quick. It's got no power low down, I said, but it suddenly kicks in. He said, that's because it's got a 649 cam in it, which I had heard about. So I thought, oh, this, this car is so nice. So we decided then, my brother and I, that we would build a racing Mini, an 850. And we started racing in around about, six, about 68, late end of 68. And unfortunately, my first effort at um, Brands Hatch during practice, it landed on its roof and it was finished. So we had to then come back and build another one, which we did as an 850. They were called 850 Special Saloons. But the problem with an 850 was you had a saloon car race with four classes and you were at the back. So you were always running nearly at the back of the field, which was OK, but it'd be better to be at the front. So we then moved to a one litre Cooper S. We were sponsored by my brother's work, Hexagon, and we had a couple of really good years with that. And, um, we, you know, we won a few races. And that was sort of five years of mini racing that was, um, you know, something, something really to savour. Mum was a Catholic. And she used to see us setting off in the, in, with the trailer. She'd come rushing out and we had to bless ourselves with holy water for the trip. And that, that's just how she was. The GTB was replaced by Ferrari Daytona. So I then had the Daytona and the GT40, but I was always, always hankered after a Mura, Lamborghini Mura. So I waited for the phone call from her brother. He said, you yeah, know, we've got a Mura coming in. We don't want it because it's... Um, you know, we're still in this petrol crisis, blah, blah, blah. So he said, but we can buy it privately. It's down for sale in Surrey, and the chap wants uh, £4,000 for it. It was a right-hand drive Lamborghini Mura S, 1970, of which there was only 10 made right-hand drive. And he said, oh, by the way, um, first owner was Twiggy, who at the time was a very, very famous model. So we went down to Surrey, and agreed to buy the car for 4,000 quid before we'd even seen it. So we took down a banker's draft for 4,000. It was green. She specified it Lamborghini Lime Green because it left the factory, factory line in white. So she had it specified Lamborghini Lime Green and orange stripes. The most recognisable mirror in the world. So we went down and saw the car on the drive. Key was in it didn't see anybody, knocked on the door, and a voice said, put the cheque through the door. So we put the cheque, it was in an envelope, put it through the door, and I said, is everything okay? 
He said, yes, off you go. So we drove back from Surrey in this mirror and it was just a stunning bit of kit. And I think probably of all the cars I'd, I'd had, I think I would probably quite like that one back. Well, I could have it back tomorrow if I had the money because it's for sale in uh, Australia for 1.6 million. That was the Mura, drove it home, had it for two years, and it was a very quick car, but its brakes weren't that hot, and the handling wasn't brilliant. Plus, you had a, v, a V12 engine right behind your ear, just a few inches behind your ear, so it was incredibly noisy. So we had that um, a couple of years. That was a great hit with the ladies. They loved it. I had a call one day from a friend. He said, oh, a friend of mine wants to go in your Mura. I said, okay. He said, I've just taken her up in my airplane. She loved it. Can you take her out in the Mura? So she came out uh, in her MG midget up to the garage. And so I took her out. And then she said, um, oh, she said, thanks, Mike. That was absolutely brilliant. And then, strangely, and it's never happened before, she took her pants off and hung the pants on the steering, on the gear stick. I thought, that's a strange thing to do. Anyway, that was it. I never saw her again. So um, that's one of my memories of the Mura, really, <laughs> which is quite odd. Um, so I, that we kept two years. I paid 4000 for it, and we sold it for eight. Uh, couldn't sell it in England, and it went to Australia. And the chap there bought it. He had it quite a few years, and he went to another owner, and he had it for probably 20 or 30 years, and it was in a museum, in um, Birdwood Museum in Australia. So that was, a, that was a very interesting car, I must say. I sold my Mura in uh, 1976, and my brother bought his Mura in 1978, so he was quite young, and I wouldn't drive it. It was left-hand drive. It was an awful, awful car. But he said, oh, no, you know, it goes well, and it stops and starts. And I said, yeah, but it's, it's dangerous to drive. It just didn't feel right. Two years ago, I was approached by Simon Kidston's company that were making the Mura register. Every Mura made, 762 made, were all going to go in a register. And I helped with mine, and I said to the chap who was the researcher, I said, what about my brother's car? He said, I know this car. He said, it was number 12 off the production line. I said, but it was just an awful car. So the next thing I know is I get this picture of a crashed Mura, which was in actual fact my brother's car that had been damaged three or four years before and the driver had been killed. And it was just a total and utter wreck. And I felt in a funny sort of way vindicated that I said the car was horrendous, and it was, and there was a reason why. So where that car is now, it was rebuilt again in the 2000s, probably re rebuilt to a new spec, and it's probably fine now. But that was, um, yeah, that, that was a sad car. Dad was in a car park in Bury St Edmunds on Angel Hill in the Mura, 1976. And Mum had gone off shopping, he sat in the car in the car park. And a lady came along, tapped on the window, oldish lady, and she said, is this your car? And Dad says, yes. She said, this is the most antisocial car I have ever seen. Dad was a shy guy, and for someone to say that to him, okay, it was Lamborghini lime green, it had orange stripes, um, but he was very upset that this woman had said this to him. So he took it back to Bretnam and rang and said, boys, we need to get rid of this car. I've just been approached by a lady who says it's antisocial. Can you look out for something else for me? So we were a bit sad. Um, so the car went to Australia and we bought him a Type 14 Lotus Elite, which he absolutely loved. Constant tinkering, but he loved it. So that was 76, he had it a couple of years. And then we had the opportunity to buy a Ferrari Dino 246. GTS that was wanting to be part exchanged at Lancaster's, but the chap wanted too much money. It's about 5,500. So I met him in Colchester and I didn't like him, but I liked the car. So we bought that car for dad and he had that car for a couple of years. He absolutely loved it. He was getting a bit older, so this was gonna be really his last, you know, 
quick car before he went slowed up a bit. So I like the car and perchance there was a, uh, a yellow one that used to pass through past the garage on a regular basis. So I found out whose it was and its registration was one KVW, so I always remember the registration. So I found out who it was and spoke to his son. I said, if your dad ever wants to sell that car, I'm quite keen, so I've known it from new, and I'm quite keen to buy it. And so in about 83, 1983, uh, I bought the car, it was 4,000 pounds, but it was awful. Um, it had electrical problems. It had problems one after the other. So. I had the opportunity to sell it to a chap who I knew. I said, look, these are the problems. It's starting to get rusty. So he, he bought it and spent an absolute fortune on it and lost money. So they were the two Dinos, um, incredibly attractive looking cars, and they're up now the 300,000 mark. Um, but they didn't have a Ferrari badge on. They, you know, they were Dinos and that was it. But at the end of the day, it was a Ferrari. And it, was, uh, it was good. I started to get showing interest in Porsches, which I'd never really um, had an interest in before. But there were, one came up for sale in Oldham, and I'd never been to Lancashire before. I went up one night and looked at this car. It was black, in the dark, nice chap. And um, we agreed a price of 5,500. So I went up the next day with a friend and we bought it back, paid for it, bought it back. And I wasn't that impressed with how fast it was. So when I got back to the garage, I said to one of the chaps, I said, can you just have a look at that car? It doesn't seem very quick to me. So he took the back up and he started fiddling around, twisting the distributor. So, and suddenly it, the, the tick over from sort of 600 went to 1,000. I said, that sounds better. So I took it up the road afterwards and it was just so quick. Um, and I kept that for um, a year and then the local Porsche dealers, Lancaster's in um, uh, Colchester, offered me an amount for it that gave me a small bit of profit. Now they're six or seven hundred thousand, they've sort of rocketed in value over the years. Following on from the um, RS, I then moved to a turbo, three litre turbo which was a completely different kettle of fish. It was so fast, but that did not make any money. Um, I think I paid 11,000 and I think I got 12 back, plus I'd had to run it. But it was a quick car, you know, huge power. Um, so that really was, they were my, I had other Porsches of a lesser kind, but they were my two favorite Porsches and probably the RS was the most practical. I was at the garage one day and brother rang again. He said, oh, we've got a, problem. We, we've taken in a Pantera that isn't as good as we thought it was. It's got rust in the back and we just want to get shot of it and we want 2,600 quid for it. So I said, well, yeah, we'll give it a go because it, it's a hospital job in a garage. Having something like that is quite nice. But basically the engine sits in the back and where it sat on the subframe was a bit rusty. So we took the engine out, did the rust, painted it. It was silver. We painted it silver again. And um, it had a problem that it constantly shed fan belts, which were just behind your ear. I don't know what the problem was, but um, I wasn't in love with the car. I was in love with the looks. So my uh, chap who ran my garage in the workshop, Jeffrey, I said, you know, we need a trip out in this. Where should we go? He said, I've got just the place. I've got tickets to see Led Zeppelin at Nebworth. Shall we go in the Pantera? So we set off to see um, Led Zeppelin, which I think was their last concert as a, as a full band. We went to uh, Nebworth and, and I think Led Zeppelin came on at about one o'clock in the morning I and mean, it was an inc incredibly long day. Ford Cleveland engine, which sounded really nice. It was a gorgeous looking car, but I just didn't trust it. Um, and I sold it for 3,000, so I, I lost money on that car. I was missing racing after the uh, Mini had gone, and in 1981 I had the opportunity to buy a Ford Fiesta to, to join in the Ford Fiesta Championship, which was run by Fords. So it was basically a Fiesta with an XR2 engine in 1.6, about 100 brake horsepower. So I paid, I think, 4,000 for, for this Fiesta, and loaded it on the trailer, and as I left, 
the chap said, oh, by the way, um, the cam is running an illegal camshaft because they were very fussy forwards about these cars being totally standard. And the first three cars of every race were checked. Why did he tell me that now? Anyway, he did. So I set off back and my first race was at Snetterton. And um, I came fourth and I, I was keeping up, you know, with the leaders, but it was new to me, I came fourth. And then I thought, if I ever come in the top three, they're gonna check over the car, which is gonna be a bit of a problem. So I did a couple more races. I think I did Mallory uh, and Lydon. I was keeping up. I thought, well, I've got to be really careful here. I was running fifth or sixth. Took the engine out and I got it rebuilt, had it blueprinted to the original Ford spec. And the next time I took it out, I, I was slower than everybody else. So all that told me was that they were running dodgy engines. So I did that for a year and had some good runs and Ford paid for us to go to Zolder in Belgium um, to race. And it was, uh, it was a good year, but it wasn't a successful year. It was costing 400 pounds a weekend. Fords were very fussy about the cars being in prime condition. So with the dents, it all had to be sorted out. And um, it was, I, I'm glad I did it, but really nothing was gained. The garage um, was going well. Um, I sold it in 1981. I moved into uh, vehicle leasing as a broker, which I did then for the next 40 years. That was really, that was my life ahead. But my big blow uh, and my worst year was 1985. My wife and I decided that we would get divorced. Nothing to do with her, all to do with me. So that was an incredibly bad year. So really, a lot of things went out the window. I lived with my friend Stuart, who used to run my workshop, and I realised that I hadn't got a clue how to run my life. First time I used a washing machine, I put whites and blacks in together, and I thought, I know absolutely nothing. I, I was quite down in the dumps. And um, I'd been dealing with a, a company in London who used to find me leasing cars, XR3s, uh, Peugeot, GTIs, which nobody could get, but they could get them. So I was buying quite a few cars from this company called Carbase in Greenwich. And I was talking to a girl on the phone on a regular basis. And we got on quite well. Um, so I was living on my own and desperate really to get going again in my life. Because I had obviously had quite a bit of maintenance to pay. I kept in contact with my two kids. I went to meet her in London. We got on really well. And uh, she was Uruguayan, but spoke beautiful English. And um, so that really was the next phase of my life was I moved in with her in London, Blackheath. And I then changed jobs in terms of, I didn't work from home, I worked for my local Ford dealer in South Walden, and I was their F&I man. So I did their finance and insurance uh, they're called business managers today. They gave me a free office and they gave me a free new XR3. So I was quite happy with that. And um, things started to change a bit better. I got on well with this girl and we got on well. And I said, look, I don't really like London because I was driving from London to Saffron Walden every day against the traffic, so it didn't take that long. But it was a bit of a haul. Uh, plus my car was constantly broken into. So uh, we decided to buy a house in Essex and it was a we had to go for bid we had to bid for it because it was a time when the houses this is 87 the houses were going up in value and just because they were for sale for whatever you had to bid up to get it so th this house came up for a hundred thousand and we went to 120 and we weren't the highest bidder but we hadn't got anywhere to sell so we went we bought this house for 120 uh, 20,000 deposit, borrowed 100,000 at 7%. Right, this was 87. 1991, the mortgage has shot up to 15%, plus the house prices were dropping. So we had a bit of a problem, and it caused a bit of a, an upset between us. Um, and so we split in 93, and, you know, she went back to London. And, um, you know, I then was in a bit of a quandary again. So I was, this is uh, 81. Nine, so I sold the garage um, in 81, 82. 
started my leasing business, moved into a Ford dealership to, um, you know, help them, as I've just, you know, talked about earlier, Cleo's and Saffron Walden. And then I had a, a, a chap rang and said, oh, can you sort, find me a, a Sierra Cosworth? Um, so I sorted the money out and I said, I'll find you a car. So there was one up at Mike Young's at, uh, in Romford who was the Cosworth man. So I went up to pick up this Moonstone Blue 1986 Cosworth and it was just, it blew my mind. It was so quick. And not only that, but it was the first car I'd ever been in with a telephone in the car. And the telephone was, it was called a meter maid and you shouted the number at it, somebody answered and it was just brilliant. So that was my first first mobile phone car, phone really. So I got this car back and I, I just loved it, delivered it to the customer, he loved it. And I thought in my head, I do need to get one of these, but I got, hadn't got much money. You know, the recently, fairly recently divorced and things were a bit tight. So I then found a car, a white car at uh, Mike Young's. Um, it was 16,000 pounds. So I had six and I had to borrow 10. And I never did dare tell dad that I borrowed money from, you know, from a finance company. So I had that um, for a couple of years. I think I bought that in 1988. Bought, had that a couple of years. And I made the mistake then of using it as a track car. And tracking a car can affect it. And we were down at Goodwood on a track day and it blew a head gasket. So I had to leave the car at Chichester at the Ford dealer for a head gasket and my brother was there as well and he said oh you can buy my you can borrow my car to get back and he was in he had a Metro 6R4 now all very pretty looking but a total non-road vehicle it pulled left and right it got on a white line you couldn't get off the white line it was, it was quite hairy but it got me home and then uh, a week later I went and picked up the Cosworth but i I'd fallen out of love with it then. I thought, I'm not gonna track it again. So I saw a, a, another Cosworth, a Rally Cosworth for sale in Yorkshire, D74EYU, the number. And as I went up to see it, again, that was 16,000. He gave me 12 for, for my Cosworth. So I had to come up with four grand, which I managed. And I went to pick up this car and it was the Group N rally car was limited to 300 brake horsepower, but it just felt so much more. It was a gorgeous looking thing. And so I drove that back um, from Yorkshire and then I started to research it and I realized it was quite a well-known car. It was uh, Ford in 86, had got a competition to find a rally driver. And the rally driver, the first prize was they could use the car in rallying for a year at no cost. Ford would pay for everything. And it was won by a chap called George Donaldson, and who I actually met a couple of years ago. So I used that as a road car, I think for three years, and it was just, it was magic, totally magic. Um, and that um, probably was one of my favorite, what I would call full on converted road cars. But I lost a lot of money on it, as it cost me 16,000 and at the time, so we're talking here probably 92, 93, we were back in recession again. And we were noticing this because the cars that were being leased, people were sending them back and they weren't worth anything like the money owing on them. So it was a bad period. My mortgage was, has gone up sky high. So um, I lost about 6,000 on that car. And I understand that whoever bought it went banger racing with it. It was a total travesty of justice to to bang a race a car like that, but it, it, you know I, I did sell it and I had to. Around this time, I was asked by a customer to find him a Lister Jaguar. I knew Brian Lister quite well because he lived in the local village, but I didn't really know much about the the cars that uh, were converted from XJSs. So I found one at uh, the Lister factory. The main factory has always been in Cambridge, but there was one that they did the racing cars down in Surrey. Uh, a chap called Lawrence Pierce owned it and he had the car for sale on behalf of a customer. So I went down to see it, dark green, about six, seven hundred brake horsepower, and we agreed a price <coughs> of 53,000. It was a couple of years old, 
done very few miles, owned by a city banker. So we bought the car for the customer, bought it back. My son and I went down to pick it up. It rained on the way back um, and it, was steam it, was, it wasn't a particularly nice car to drive in the wet. So um, I drove halfway and my son drove the rest of the way. We delivered it up near Peterborough. The chap's wife, for some reason, didn't like it. I don't know why, um, as it was a nice looking car, but she just did not like it and would not get in it. So after a month, we got the call, we need to get rid of this car. It was on lease, smallish deposit. And I thought, how are we gonna get out of this? Because, uh, you know, with a lease from day one, you owe a bit more than, you, than you've borrowed. So we met, eventually managed to get rid of it by buying a BMW Alpina B12. This was a car that was for sale at Sittner's and in Nottingham, and it was owned by, that was Frank Sittner's car. And it was 112,000 new. And I thought, there's so much money. So we I did a deal and I think we paid, I think about 90 for it, where that was the only way we could get our money back on the Lister. So we did actually get the money back within a few thousand, but we'd then taken on an Alpina which God knows how much was that going to drop. But, it, you know, it was a nice car. There was very few of them. And the customer's wife was happy with the Alpina. So he, he kept that for a, a year or two. And then he said, oh, can you get rid of it? You know, want to buy something else. So um, I found a customer in London who was a dentist. So I went up to show it in North London and um, went in, beautiful place. The girl said, oh, can you go and sit in the waiting room? You know, he'll be out soon. So I sat in the waiting room, sat next to Sarah Brightman, who I knew was a bit of a stage star. So I was chatting away to her. Um, that's what I remember about that day. Anyway, he did buy the car. Uh, again, more money lost, but we had got rid of it. Um, I found it, um, so I drove it for about a month while we were trying to sell it. Um, obviously the petrol consumption was horrendous, but it was a very large car, there's no doubt about that, a huge bonnet. You couldn't take it into car parks. But, you know, it was quite pretty and it was rare. The chap who we'd got the Alpina for decided he wanted a Ferrari 360. He had found one down in the West Country, so I went down, it was a, a year 2000 car, W Reg, uh, very low mileage, silver, gorgeous looking thing. So I went to, to pick it up in uh, the West Country, took it to him, and I thought, this car is just so amazing, because it's the first Ferrari I'd driven since my 308, and things had moved on a huge amount. The Fiat money had gone into Ferrari, and this was just a a really gorgeous car and it, it just felt it was going to get to wherever you were going to go. Um, so he had that car 2002 to about 2004 and what happened at this time when the cars were coming back from lease I would buy them at quite a heavily discounted price which I needed because that, 308, that uh, 360 that was 88,000 and we actually sold it for 53. So in two years, it had dropped that amount of money. But that's how it was in the early 2000s. And um, so that, that was just, you know, a gorgeous bit of kit because I'd only driven the 308, I'd driven the 355, but this was another step forward. And I, I really enjoyed that car for two years. And the only problem, I suppose you could say, it, it had a paddle shift, which I enjoyed. They were called them, uh, 360 Modena F1 with a paddle shift. And I suppose um, whether I would have preferred the manual, I don't know, but it was quick. It was really quick. So that was uh, two years back in Ferrari, but I, I knew deep down that would be the last Ferrari I would own. So the Ferrari went and then the uh, Ferrari owner said, can you find me um, a Porsche? I want a 996 twin turbo. So that would it was actually a 2002 car and we were in 2004. And the registration was a bit unpleasant. It was B1CHA. When I picked it up, the chap said, 
oh, by the way, um, it's had a conversion. And I said, well, what do you mean by a conversion? He says, it's got a bit more power. I said, what, a bit more than the 450? He says, yeah, it's just under 500 brake horsepower. So I said, okay, um, it doesn't matter. I said, because we still would have bought it, but why he didn't say it before, I don't know. And then he produced a road test of the car, 202 miles an hour. I thought, this is a very quick car. So the chap had it about a year, and then I bought that um, and kept it about a year. But it was, it was so fast, and it was stable, the brakes were amazing, but it was so quick, it was impossible to keep, virtually impossible to keep to 30, 40 miles an hour. Not because it was intractable, it was because it just wanted to go the whole time. And I remember that car taking, going down to Bath for a weekend. I took my wife down to Bath, and I thought that the dual carriageway going into Bath was a 70 mile limit, but it was a 50 mile limit. So I'm pooling along at 70, and then suddenly the blue lights behind me and he pulled me over and he said, do you realize what speed you're doing? And I said, yes, 70. He said, exactly. He said, but it's a 50 limit. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, well, who do you think you are? Sterling Moss. And I said, no, Michael Schumacher. And that didn't go down well. And I got a speeding ticket. And he said, would you give me the ticket? He said, if you hadn't have opened your gob, you'd have got away with it. So another lesson learned. But that car, um, was just a stunning Porsche, and I can't imagine a, a Porsche being any better than that. So we get to 2003, 2004, and a chap rings up and he says, oh, can you get me an Elise S1? Uh, red, preferably. I found one in Chelmsford, 12,800 pounds. So it was about three years old, very low mileage, hard top, and it had had the 135 brake horsepower conversion at the factory, which was apparently another £4,000. So it was quite an expensive car. So I went to buy that and took it to the chap, and he couldn't get in it. Um, I said, well, you know, put your bum on the sill and slide in, but it didn't work. Um, I got him in to the passenger seat, and then he couldn't get out. So I thought, my goodness, what am I going to do now? Um, so he said, well, why don't you keep it? <laughs> I said, oh, OK, but I hadn't got much of a choice. So I had to pay 12800 for a car I didn't want. But once I'd driven it, I absolutely loved it. I picked it up in Chelmsford. I went along Essex Regiment Way. It was quick. It was handled like a dream. It was difficult to get in and out, but once you were in, it was just, you know, stunning. So I had that for a year, and then a friend of mine, he said, oh, when you want to sell that, um, Elise, let me know. So I kept it a year. And I had my eye on a Series 2, because I know it's, it's um, blasphemous, but I think the Series 2 is better looking. So, um, so he had that, and I saw an Elise S2 for sale in Scotland, because I wanted one with cloth trim. I didn't want the leather, because I always found that you heat up a bit. So I flew to Scotland, uh, I took two checks with me, a banker's draft for the, to pay off the finance and a banker's draft for the customer. Very nice guy. So I went up and uh, drove it back. And I had that car for probably eight years. And then something happened. I was diagnosed with cancer. And I had melanoma on my back, which they sliced out. But at the same time, they took out all of my lymph nodes from under my arm to check if it had gone further into my body. And I couldn't move my arm. So I thought, well, I'm never ever gonna be able to change a gear shift on an Elise, because it was quite a sturdy bit of work. So I stupidly sold it to a chap in Holland who bought it over the phone, and I lost money on it. I paid 16,000 for it, and he paid 10. Um, but I'd had the years out of it, but now those cars are worth 24, 25,000. So that was my Second Elise, probably one of the best cars I've ever owned. It never went wrong. Neither of them ever went wrong. They had the Rover 1.8 engines. Never went wrong. Looked so pretty, and I just love that S2. And sadly, about a year after I sold it, all my arms started working again, and I thought, oh, what a pain. I've got rid of this car when um, maybe, you know, I shouldn't have done. Around the year 2002, I started organising charity events raising money for our local children's hospice. But in 2007, we had our meeting, uh, 150 of us, in Latuque. 
beautiful hotel. And my brother came along and during the meal, he started coughing up blood. So I thought, this is a bit strange. He was a heavy smoker, so nothing ever surprised me. And about six or seven months later, he said, I've got cancer of the esophagus, cancer of the throat. So I said, well, you know, you're near Charing Cross Hospital, sort yourself out, blah, blah, blah. Tried to treat it fairly mildly. But in the summer of 2009, he died. So the, a brother that I can honestly say that I'd never had an argument with, unlike the latest royal kids, never had an argument with him, and he was gone. So I went, I was with him on the Sunday, watching the Spanish Grand Prix in London, he lived in Fulham, and on Tuesday he was dead. And it was such a shock, because we knew he was ill, you know, we knew he was having chemo, but it happened so quickly. So that really was one of the, well, it was probably the saddest day of my life. But, um, you know, I coped, and I've said it before, that if you've had a strong upbringing and everybody's happy in your household, in the family, it does give you strength to deal with stuff like this. And that was probably, um, that was a shocker for me and uh, probably will never get over it. We had another, I had another disaster. So in 2014, um, Adam Brooks in Cambridge discovered I had bowel cancer, but it was stage two. So it was caught very early, simply down to their expertise. So I went in, um, they put me in this long tube thing, took whatever they do, the scans. And then when the scan was done, the doctor said to me, oh, would you like to come and to my office? And I thought, hmm, what's all this about? So, and he said, oh, he called someone for a nurse to be with us. So he said, we've, we'd found some cancerous polyps in your colon and not only do we want to cut them out, but we want to cut a bit of the colon out as well, where they were sitting. So I'd had a colonoscopy where you sit in front of a screen and watch this tube go up into your stomach, round. So, uh, you know, I could see what the problem was. Um, and he said, you know, do you want an operation? Or what do, you, what do you want us to do? And I said, I want you to cut it out. He said, well, don't you think you want to talk to your wife? I said, no. So we made a, the date, I went in, they chopped it out. I was only in there about, uh, how long was I in there? Probably only one night, but it, it was a horrendous night. So during this time, I thought I'd been putting stories on forums about my cars, which initially weren't believed until I started putting photos on. So I started that actually in 2002. So I thought, I need to get this in writing because a lot of people said, oh, why don't you write a... So there I was, like the Grim Reaper on my shoulder. I thought I'd better get on and write my book, the stories. So I started the book. Um, luckily, a friend of mine had a disc of all the stories I put on the internet. He got them all. So there was my book. All I had to do then was filter it out and make it into something. So I wrote the book. It was launched April 2016. And another great day in my life. We used a, a, a pub in Blackmore End, The Bull. And 400 people turned up. There was, there was Lamborghinis, Ferraris. It was absolutely magic. And, you know, that book sold really well. And what I said was that... Um, a big percentage of the um, sales would go towards the hospice in South End, And they've had up to now about 22,000 from my books. I chose the hospice in South End because my wife and I had been watching the television one night on Anglia TV and they showed um, the only children's hospice in Essex, which was Little Havens in, near South End. So when we started fundraising, um, this is probably 2002, 2003, we decided that the money would go to them. And we, ha we had some brilliant fundraising charity sessions at the BRDC Silverstone. And our best year was 2008, just before the financial crash, when we raised 51,000 in a year. And so we've been, I've been supporting them ever since, really. So I took the manuscript in to the hospice. Bearing in mind, I was writing about periods 40 years before. 
And she said to me, the lady, she said, there's certain words in here, Michael, you cannot use. Because I wanted their logo on the front. She said, if you want the logo on the front, you've got to change some words. So she gave me a list of words I couldn't use. I couldn't describe my girlfriend as a bird. I had a lot of censoring to do, which I considered were a normal word from that era, but unfortunately they didn't see it like that. So I couldn't have the logo on the front because I didn't take all the words out, but I had a strip on the back page that said, you know, where the money was going. So that was, uh, that was 2016, and the books are really well. I mean, the first thousand went in a flash, and I thought, well, I'll do, that was called Let Them Stare, I'll do Let Them Stare again. I said, I'll presume that everybody that bought the first book will buy the second book. But that actually wasn't the case. What, what the case was that the second book was more modern. It went from 1985 to 2005. And the interest wasn't in that era. The interest was in the previous era, which was 1965 to 1985, my first book. So um, I was disappointed in the sales of the second book. But they sold, and they still are, you know, a bit at a time. So, you know, book one has sold 5,000. So I can't really complain because that book one is still selling. And it's people say, oh, they go on the site, they say, oh, done book two as well, and they buy that. So eventually, you know, um, it'll make good sales. But um, that book one was just, uh, it was just mega for me, really. In 2015, um, I was reading Max Mosley's book, which had just been released, called Formula One and Beyond, because he ran F1 with Bernie for 16 years. And there was a book launch in London. A week before, I had been looking at the Bonham sale, and I noticed there was for sale a Lotus Elite first owner, a Mr Mosley from Manchester. Bonhams hadn't cottoned on to who the Mr. Mosley was. I had. So after Max had done his speech, I went up to him, said, oh, blah, 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 blah. I think your um, elite that you bought new in 1961 was sold at Bonhams last week. And he touched my arm. He said, what, 9364ND? That was the reg. I said, yeah. He said, how can we get it? So then I went to Bonhams and I said, uh, told a little bit of a porky. I said I was the underbidder and I wanted to buy the car. I should have, you know, should have paid more. So I spoke to a chap at Bonham's called Mark Gold, who was very nice, very helpful. He said, "I'll alert the owner that you may want to buy the car." So he contacted the owner and he said, "I'll get him to ring you." A few minutes after I'd sent the message, the phone rang, and it was a chap from America, Maine, in America, and he happened to. He'd bought the car, but he happened to be a classic car dealer. And he would buy cars in this country, take them to America, uh, do whatever's needed in America, and then sell them. So he was quite happy to pass it on. So I said to Max, look, we've got the opportunity to buy the car. We're going to have to pay a bit extra to get it, because uh, it sold at 58, for 58000 at um, Bonhams. So then... Then began, really, my seven-year friendship with, with Max, because the car has always been here. He's always paid for everything. Um, you know, I just store it and use it. And it was just um, a very nice friendship. We went to London. We used to go to the Hawks Mall near him to have a steak. I brought him down to um, Essex a couple of times, A, to check the car out that it was his, which it was. And the way it was proved to be his. He said he'd had a battery isolation switch behind the seat where nobody could see it. So he came down here, looked at the car, and the switch was there. So it was definitely his car. So there was no argument about that. Chassis number 1649, which is shown up as his in the Lotus Register. So that went on. Um, a lot of money was spent on it because these cars always want money spending. And um, that car has remained here for nearly eight years. Max died, sadly, in May 2021. And um, there is now, um, I, I now still look after the car, um, but it's a slightly different relationship with the family. But sadly, Max's wife died six or seven months after he did. 
So you can imagine, and it was an expensive will, and it, it'll probably you know, run for four years, the will. Max was keen to get the car back because A, he, uh, when he bought it, he went with his wife all around Europe in it, and I think it only broke down twice. Uh, he went to the, the Grand Prix around Europe. Um, he also picked up his first dog in it. Uh, so he had memories, and uh, you know, when we got it, he said, you know, I don't want this car ever to leave the family. So, um, you know, it's gonna, it'll be here for, you know, probably till I peg out, I should think. We picked him up, I have a friend in London, Nicholas, who lives in Highgate, and he used to pick up Max and bring him down to a really nice pub, uh, not far from here, in Matching Green. And he came down probably three or four times, but he never, he did drive it, but it was just round the block and back again. So, and he tried it a bit in London, it didn't really work in London, um, because it's so small and all the cars now are so big. So, um, it was an interesting. Um, it, it was an interesting time, and I can honestly say I've never met a nicer, more generous chap. Looking back on my life, I realise how incredibly lucky I've been. I was brought up in an era, you know, no mobile phones, no televisions, and we were very, very lucky to have probably the best parents in the world. I was lucky to have the best brother. So in that respect, looking back, we I didn't really realise at the time how lucky I was. But over the years, as you see the world disintegrate, you realise, you know, maybe at the time I should have been more appreciative, but nobody can really say what the future is going to hold. And, you know, through my life, I haven't had much adversity, but, you know, when I've had it, I've been able to deal with it. And I put that down solely to, to um, being brought up, you know, in a nice family home. Um, I've, I've just finished my fourth book. I had, had the first book was Let Them Stare, second book, Let Them Stare Again. My third book was totally about the Lotus Elite. And it was, it's called Chasing Elites, and it came out in 2020, and that sold really well. And Max happily did the forward for me. Really pleased with that book. My fourth book um, is the story of the first 10 years of what I call the Royal Concours. These are Concours events held every year at Royal Palaces. Um, started at Windsor Castle, then it went to Holyrood House, uh, Marlborough House, and now it's full time in Hampton Court. So I, I've, that book's just come out, and whether or not the organisers will take it on and, and promote it, I don't know. I'm quite pleased with what I've done, and I think it's a good legacy for the kids. Um, I have almost four books on the shelf. Oh, that was granddad's. So, um, yeah, I'm happy with how things have turned out. And I think I'm fit again. I have a cancer check every year. I'm due again in June. And I haven't got uh, a proper examination until 2024. But I don't think it's going to come back. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm fit and healthy. Um, I remarried in 2004. And, um, you know, that's going well. In recent years, I've had a collection of grandchildren and I've, I spend a lot of time with them. This afternoon, I'm going to pick um, Felix up from nursery. And I've told my children, you know, what my life was like. And I think I'm quite keen to tell my grandchildren because one in particular, Felix, he, he is a petrol head. I mean, he's two and a half, you know, and he'll, he'll walk by and say, you know, that's a Fiat 500 and things like that. And I think maybe I'm getting him in the right direction. So I dedicated my um, second book, or was it my third book? My third book to the grandchildren, of which I've got coming up for seven. I've got another one due in a couple of weeks. But I think the thing is now, as I'm older, as I'm coming up for 76, I spend more time with my grandchildren than I did with my children because... You know, in, when I went to work, I went out at 20 past seven in the morning, got back at six, very rarely saw the kids. So in a way, um, my life, in a funny sort of way, has started again with, you know, with the children. And I'm lucky that, um, you know, they've, they're all lovely kids. But um, I think possibly I'll, um, you know, tell them stories. And I hope, you know, when they're a bit older, they'll, you know, realise how lucky I was.